Here you have three primates. Many of you tennis fans will recognize Andy Murray, yeah. Wimbledon champion, one of the great tennis players. And he has two little buddies there. I asked them, of these three primates, which two do you think are the closest related to each other? And people usually scoff at such a silly question. Of course it's the two monkeys. That's actually wrong in two ways. Quite simply, these are not monkeys. Okay? They're apes, and there's a very important difference. More subtly, the truth lies in the fact that these two guys are more closely related to each other. Their common ancestor was about six million years ago. This guy, his lineage dates back probably two or three million years beyond that, so it's more distant. How should I believe this? It's so counterintuitive. Well, the evidence is overwhelming from many disciplines. Here's a re recent summary. It's the genetic basis of human brain evolution. And what we have here is actually a family tree. Dominating the tree is the biological order of primates, Ling Zhang Lei. And step by step, various primates split off from each other in terms of the genetic relationship. So way at the other end is New World monkeys. Actually, if it's tree were still larger, you'll have another branch for prosimians. Next to New World monkeys are the Old World monkeys. These are the monkeys that we see, for instance, in the primate park here in Hong Kong. Rhesus monkeys, for instance, macaques, baboons, these are all Old World monkeys. And then come the apes. One way of referring to the apes is that they're hominids, whereas we, we are hominids. Of the hominids, the orangutan has, a, has been studied quite a bit, but it's not in Africa, it's Southeast Asia. Then gorillas and the chimpanzees. So we're by far closest to the chimpanzees. And about six million years ago, we started to diverge. If we took this point and drew a detailed tree, that will be indeed a very, very complex tree. But I'm simplifying tremendously here. I'll simplify by first saying that there were these creatures called Australopithecus first found in Ethiopia, in a region called Afar. And then our genus came into being, the genus Homo. And the Homo habilis were the first to make some tools. Then Homo erectus, Chao Ren, Zhi Li Ren, Zhi Ren, and we are Homo sapiens. So this line gives you millions of years since our common last, common, last common ancestor. This line gives you the genetic distance. And this line is actually very, very informative. It gives you the size of the brain. So in our case, the brain size is around 1,200 cc's to 1,700 cc's, whereas Chimpanzees, gorillas, the land of that, 
come, don't even come close. Big, big difference in spite of gorilla's huge size and so on. And um, things are always changing as our understanding improves. The discovery of these fossils started in the 1920s in China. There, there was a Swedish uh, geologist by the name of Anderson. He was given some clues that there were some stones that didn't seem to belong to the Jokodian area. So they started to explore. And that, of course, was the first step toward discovering Beijing Yuanren, at Zhou um, one of the suburbs of Beijing. One of the themes that I want to stress in these 20 minutes or so is that we're always moving forward. Okay? Just when we think we have a re relatively complete picture of the fossils in China, another discovery gets reported. This was, re this was discovered uh, this was just reported this year. And this is a site in, in Xuchang, in Henan, at a site called Lingjing. It's the Institute of Paleoanthropology and Vertebrate Studies that our guests recently visited. They've been doing tremendous work for almost a century now. What's interesting about their discovery is that they did rather detailed analysis of these fossils, and uh, which date back to 100,000, no more, years ago. And the authors say that they share hand old world trends they reflect Eastern Eurasian ancestry, morphology with the Neanderthals, and so on. So this morphological combination reflects the Pleistocene human evolution patterns in general biology, as well as in regional continuity and interregional population dynamics. When a science first begins, there's always a tendency to simplify. It's necessary, necessarily so. But the idea of species, just like the idea of language, uh, grows over simplifications. There's a great deal of mixture biologically. There's a great deal of mixture linguistically. So I added a little comment there. I said. The mosaic nature of the cranial morphologies from peoples came into contact is like the ubiquitous linguistic mixtures that take place when languages come into contact. You take a language like English, you can find traces of at least a dozen different language families having inserted words into English. And you can do this probably <coughs> for all languages. 